Public.com presents Leading Indicator, an investing show bringing you insights from the sharpest leaders in business, finance, and technology. With us today to recap the Fed's March meeting is Joseph Wang of FedGuy.com. Joseph, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Kyla. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Of course. And I'm sorry about this headphone situation. I'm having some audio issues, but I want to talk about the Fed meeting. So major indexes were up around 1% to close out Wednesday trading after the Fed decided to hold rates steady. Why were markets optimistic after this announcement? So I look at the Fed meeting as being pretty dovish. So it's no surprise that markets reacted very strongly. And even the day after, we, we see that markets continue to rally. So In understanding the Fed meeting, I think it's useful to level set a little bit. So heading into the meeting, we've had two months where inflation has consistently been surprising to the upside. Now, whether you look at CPI or PPI or PCE or even import prices, it looks like inflation has come in higher than expected over the past two months, so January and February. At the same time, it seems like financial conditions are loosening. So if you look at the stock market, if you look at credit spreads, or if you look at crypto, uh, you know, we had Dog with Hat make an appearance on the Las Vegas sphere. It seems like financial conditions are loose. So I think there was some expectation going into this meeting, given that inflation was higher than expected and financial conditions appear loose, that the Fed might be a little bit hawkish. Uh, But that did not happen, uh, not even a little bit. So This meeting was one of those quarterly meetings where we got a quarterly dot plot. The dot plot is where members of the FOMC guide the market towards where they think interest rates, inflation, and growth will be for the next few years. Now, the last dot plot we got was in December, and at December, the Fed guided towards three cuts this year. So a more hawkish surprise would have been, say, the Fed guiding for two cuts this uh, this year rather than three. But the Fed kept that, actually. So the Fed continued to guide towards three cuts this year. Now, in addition to that, I think Chair Powell made some comments during the presser that that could be interpreted as dovish. First, he was asked directly about the higher than expected inflation data, and he seemed to look through it, basically shrug it off as part of the bumpy journey towards 2% inflation. He was also asked about uh, what many think of as loosening financial conditions. And there, I think the remark was a little bit surprising in that he doesn't think financial conditions are loosening. He he asserted that, you know, financial conditions restrictive and we see slowing down in labor uh, market activity and so forth. And so that, I think, seems to suggest that, you know, he's not going to stand in the way of the... uh, surging asset prices we see across basically all markets. So I think that that was pretty dovish and pretty bullish. Now, the last thing that I thought was quite interesting is that Chair Powell also gave highly anticipated comments on the path of quantitative tightening. So at his last meeting, Chair Powell said that in the March meeting, so this week, he was going to have a big discussion with the rest of the FOMC as to the path of quantitative tightening. Now, he announced today that he's going to start tapering QT pretty soon, so fairly soon. I take that to mean the next meeting. And I think that is at least earlier than I expect. And so the market may have looked to that as a potentially a dovish sign. Obviously, when you are uh, slowing down QT, the Fed's balance shrink is shrinking at a slower rate. Now, he was careful to caveat that by noting that by slowing down the pace of QT, maybe it can go even longer. Um, But I don't think that's very persuasive. At the end of the day, all the market hears and all I hear is that they're slowing down QT. How long it actually goes? Well, you know, a lot of things can pop up coming forward in the future. And uh, maybe it just slows very quickly if we have some kind of weak economic data or, or some kind of accident in the market. So I think the market's reaction to the Fed presser was uh, reasonable. It should. Uh, it was a dovish react, dovish presser, and markets should be rallying. I was um, almost surprised with how dovish it was. Jerome Powell said, even if the labor market does strengthen, that's not going to stop us from cutting rates. And he wrote off, as you said, these two months of higher inflation prints as seasonality, essentially. Were you surprised that they kept three rate cuts on the table for 2024? And were you surprised they took off a rate cut for 2025? 
So y- you are right in that they, they did have some adjustments for the longer uh, trajectory of of policy. So I think it, it was it was a really hard cut, a really hard decision between whether or not they would have, let's say, three or two. And so I, I think three is in line with what they're projecting. So I, I would stand back and look at the totality of communication and suggest that, you know, the Fed really wants to cut rates. That's what they've been saying uh, basically uh, for a few months. I think the reason that they want to cut rates is that they're beginning to be more concerned about potential over-tightening. So over the past two years, we've had inflation come in uh, higher than expected. And so the Fed has basically been a one-mandate central bank focusing only on inflation. Now that inflation is a lot closer to 2%, they're becoming more concerned about their other mandate, which is employment. And so from their perspective, they look at the world through the lens of real interest rates. And real interest rates right now are about 2%, which as President John Williams of the New York Fed describes, monetary policy is the most restrictive it's been for maybe 20 years. And so if you have a very restrictive monetary policy, or at least what what you perceive to be a restrictive monetary policy, um, and uh, at the same time, you know, inflation is coming down and maybe the economy is slowing. You want to be cautious not to over tighten and maybe cause uh, a recession or unemployment to rise when you could avoid that. So I think they're just really, really careful and really wanting to get that soft landing. So that maybe extra caution is if that extra caution causes some euphoria in financial markets, I think that's an acceptable trade-off for them uh, to keeping unemployment low. And they indicated in the summary of economic projections that they expect GDP to increase, um, meaning that they don't expect a recession to happen anymore. Why do you think that the Fed is indicating that a recession won't happen? Yeah, that, that's a really good observation. So. In the SCP dots, the Fed thinks of the growth potential for GDP to be 1.8%. So if you're growing below 1.8%, that's basically them telling you that they think we're going to be in a recession. Now, as you know, Kyla, the GDP forecast for this year was revised up from, I think, 1.4% to about 2%. That's basically the median FOMC participant telling you that they don't think there's going to be a recession anymore. Now, this recession that we've been discussing for the past two years has been something that uh, many people have been fearing, but just doesn't seem to materialize. The Fed, looking at their current data, now is also on that bandwagon, thinking that we're, we're just not going to see a recession. And again, looking across a wide range of economic indicators, it does seem that the, GD, the, the U.S. economy is growing and things are going well. So I think it's understandable that um, this recession that we were thinking would happen maybe may not happen at all. Of course, these are famous last words. Now, a corollary to that, of course, is why? Now, the Fed was thinking a year ago that they would raise interest rates to 5%. 5% sounds like a big number, right? I think if you ask anyone a few years ago and told them that interest rates would be 5%, they would tell you that we'd have a very, very deep recession and the markets would tumble. But we do raise interest rates above 5% and none of that happened. So the corollary to this upgrade in GDP growth is that maybe monetary policy is not as restrictive as uh, we thought it was. Maybe the economy is more resilient to interest rates. And we also saw that uh, reflected in the dot plot where the FOMC on the median FOMC member moved its uh, neutral rate up from 2.5% to 2.6%. Now, that's only a very, very slight um, upward revision, but it does show that maybe Fed members are beginning to see the world a little bit differently. And this would be consistent with what's happening across the world. So uh, this week, uh, Isabel Schnabel, a senior member of the ECB, also gave a speech suggesting that maybe neutral rate is higher than, than we thought. And that would make a lot of sense given the resilience we've seen in the economy despite higher interest rates. Can you explain the concept of a neutral rate and what that would mean for how the Federal Reserve um, perceives the economy? So the neutral rate is basically a benchmark 
that the Fed uses to judge whether or not monetary policy is restrictive. So if interest rates are set above the neutral rate, that means monetary policy is restrictive and the Fed is, let's say, trying to get the economy to slow down, growth down, inflation down. If interest rates are set below the neutral rate, that's the Fed uh, trying to ease monetary policy and put upward pressure on growth and inflation. So right now, monetary policy, 5.5% Fed funds rate. How do we know? How does the Fed think about that in terms of restrictiveness? Well, if the Fed thinks that neutral is around 2.5%, 2.6%, then 55 is much higher than 25 2.6%, and so the Fed thinks it's being very restrictive. So it's just the benchmarks for the Fed to know whether or not their policy is restrictive or easy. And now they're thinking that, you know, maybe it's not a uh, policy at five and a half percent is not as restrictive as they thought. It still is restrictive, but not as restrictive as they thought. Um, and could you talk a little bit more about the quantitative tightening aspect of this? You know, I think that gets into what you just talked about with restrictive policy. Like, what does it look like to actually have tight monetary policy? The Fed is rolling assets off their balance sheet, selling assets, um, and they're saying that they're going to slow that down. And, and why would that be? So why is the, the Fed slowing down QT? The F Chair Paul was asked this, and he said that he's slowing down QT because he wants to be careful not to cause any accidents in the funding markets, that, which, which is kind of what happened the first time they did QT back in 2019. So in 2019, as the Fed was shrinking their balance sheet, we had some fireworks in the repo market where repo markets, uh, repo rates surge to uh, <laughs> uh, to unimaginable heights. Now, a repo is basically a market where people make overnight loans backed by treasury securities. Now, the Fed's interpretation of that event was that they shrank the balance sheet too much and the banking system did not have enough reserves. Now, eager to avoid that kind of mistake, this time around, as they're doing QT, they want to make sure that they don't overdo it. Now, the way that they're trying to make sure that they don't overdo this is to gradually slow down the pace where they do QT. So at the moment, they're doing QT at a maximum rate of about $95 billion a month. And that's been going really well because they think that they're just so far from the banking system not having enough reserves that it's, it's okay to go quickly. But going forward, as they approach a level where they think, you know, maybe banks might not have enough reserves, they want to slow down a bit just so that they don't accidentally overdo it. So maybe next meeting, they will change the maximum QT rate to half of what it is today for treasuries at least. And so it's just to be cautious to make sure that they don't uh, withdraw money too quickly from the banking system and cause another accident. Uh, like what we saw in September 2019. Yeah, I think Jerome Powell said that reserves are abundant and he wants them to be ample. <laughs> so I don't quite know what the difference between the two words you know, are. I, but... <laughs> I've heard that word so many times, yeah. even when I was at the Fed. I think someone's just not very good at English because those words sound very similar to me. Should have chosen something else. Yeah, and it's like very much um, not quantitative, very qualitative. Uh, yeah. But, you know, they should use the, big and very big. That, that's yeah, easy to understand. I think that's a little bit more descriptive. Um, but, you know, getting into the unemployment data. So, you know, we, ha we have seen signs of softening in the labor market. The labor market is still very resilient. But what do you think Jerome Powell is seeing in these labor market, market metrics? And how is that influencing his, their monetary policy decisions? So there's a, there's a lot of things going on in the labor market. And what I think they're seeing is that the labor market just appears to be stronger than they projected, right? So if you rewind back a year ago, it would have told you that, you know, economy is going to slow, unemployment is going to rise. But here we are, and it seems like job growth, at least based on the non-farm payrolls, uh, continues to surprise to the upside. So that surprising strength, I think it, it, it possibly could be due with, as, as Chappelle noted, strong migration. And so there's a lot of things that are happening there that um, I think that it's kind of puzzling a lot of market participants. For example, looking at the non-farm payroll, we, we know that 
in part of the surveys, let's say the household surveys, is showing a different picture than the establishment surveys. So uh, the, the non-farm payroll is composed of two different surveys. So I think a lot of people are puzzling over what's happening in the labor market. But at the end of the day, the headline numbers remain quite strong. And if the headline numbers remain strong, uh, that means that there's not a huge hurry to cut rates immediately. And, um... This will be the final question, but do you have any other insights from the Fed meeting? Like, was there anything that you were looking for that you didn't hear him say? Or do you think that he addressed everybody's concerns pretty accurately? So I, I think Chair Paul did not satisfactory really address the concerns about, about financial conditions. Now, what we've heard over the past couple of years is that a monetary policy impacts the economy by through financial conditions, right? So you make financial conditions tight, you, you decrease demand, and you slow the economy down. I think if you ask anyone on the street, they look at what's happening in the markets, look at a wide range of members, measures, looking at the Chicago Fed's own National Financial Conditions Index, and you'll see that financial conditions are quite easy. So I think it's surprising that Chair Powell wouldn't address that uh, in a more serious way, as he's just kind of hand waves it and, and says that he thinks it is restrictive. But I guess we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out in the coming months. I suspect, looking at the inflation data, inflation looks like it's probably going to stabilize around 3 and 4%. And at that time, the Fed may have to revisit how it looks at the world. Yeah, I think it's hard to look at, as you said, dog with hat on the Las Vegas sphere and not think that financial conditions are at least a little easy. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little. Um, well, thank you so much, Joseph. Everyone can find your work at fedguy.com and you're on Twitter at fedguy12. Is there anywhere else that people can find you? And you can also check me out at my YouTube channel, Joseph Wang, where awesome. I post weekly updates on uh, developments in the financial markets. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joseph. Thanks for inviting me.